We are off to a wedding this week. I am very excited to jump into this week's episode. So grab your bouquets, get your nicest green suit on, and let's head off to Orion. We are straight in with an up this week for Lower Deck Season 4, Episode 4, Something Borrowed, Something Green, and that is just Orions in general. Orions have been donning, uh, have been appearing more and more since Enterprise, really, okay? So we first had, I mean, they're one of the first aliens we ever saw in Star Trek. Yes, it was illusory, uh, Susan Oliver playing Vina back in Pike's sort of dream sequence thing, what the Talosians are beaming into his head. Yeah, don't worry about it. And we get that iconic image of the Orion slave girl in the belly dancer outfit. <laughs> slave girl. Well, they turned that one on its head, didn't it? And then, you know, they appear in the original series, they appear in the animated series, and then don't appear again until Enterprise, which I actually didn't realise there was such a gap. Now that we have, obviously, Tendi has been a main character on Lower Decks for so long. We have had Orions in the Kelvin universe. We've had Orions in the far... Ryan's? Good old Ryan. We've had the Orions in the far future as well. So I just like, I mean, I know you can't see this right now, but green. I love green. Green is my favorite color. Love the Orions. Uh, they did, however, do one thing that really annoyed me. Straight in with a down. How dare you put a Voyager pulse phaser rifle in the bin? How dare you do that? That is a down. But I'm enjoying this scene so much. Obviously, there's so much for cetacean observations. Just the, the kind of like the playful banter of like, oh, I'm a better pirate than you. I'm a better pirate than you. Uh, and then they turn around and say, ha, you're basically an Orion plagiarist. That's an up. I love that. Plenty of references there to just Orion nature in general. And then we head up to the bridge of this Gorge, actually, sorry, taking up for the Orion Interceptor as well. God, love it. Uh, and we're continuing our mystery of the little, I say little, I mean, you know, it's big enough. The thing that looks like an agonizer from the original series, that ship, and we vanish another vessel. So in this season, we've had three vessels in four episodes. That's worrying. We, 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 we then, sorry, we then go to one of my favorite lines, not just of this episode, but actually of Lower Decks overall. Tendi has just finished cataloging all of the new diseases that the biofilter captured after the most recent shore leave. We get a great episode this week for it's Tendi, Mariner and Talin. So we get this girl's trip to Orion because Tendi's sister is getting married. She's been invited to Orion. She has to go back to see her family. You know, Starfleet's like, yeah, let's be nice to the Orions. They just lost a ship. You know, Tendi's obviously not massively keen because as we know, Tendi's always been a bit cagey about her upbringing on Orion. Uh, I don't care though, because we're finally gonna see flipping Orion. Holy shit, up. Actually, just quickly coming up with the episode, like another up for just the girls' trip because Tendi, Mariner, and Tillin in this episode just have me in stitches, almost as many stitches as Mariner needs by the end. They're such a good trio. They play off against each other so well. I am loving Gabriel Ruiz as Tillin. Is anyone else loving? I mean, I am. Um, I, I'll go on, I'm going to sneak another cheeky up in for that. She's just so good in the role, so deadpan. Uh, this is a great episode for guest stars, by the way. I'll, I'll run through them there at the end. But it's there's a lot of bloody voice talent on show here. Before they go away, they, they mention, you know, kind of like, oh, um... Rutherford and Boimler, it's, it's got a bit weird now that they're, you know, they're living together, they're finishing each other's sentences. Um, and... Initially, all looks amazing. You've got Boimler, who's there just, you know, making sure his bed is properly made. Rutherford's complimenting him on that, which is wonderful. And Rutherford's like, oh, please let me know if my sleep engineering bothers you. And Boimler's just like, oh, it actually, like, relaxes me. It's great. And they high five and they shout, Brotherford! Taking up. The most passionate friendships are often torn asunder by the most seemingly simple of things. Although, to be fair, not that I am by any means a botanist, I do believe looking after a bonsai tree is not that easy. So I can understand that they want to do it right. And, and, and you know, then you've got like, Boimler's like, uh, hello, <laughs> grew up in a vineyard, you know, we raised raisins. And Rutherford's like, um, 
got an algorithm in my head about how often to mist this thing and you know it just kind of devolves within seconds it's the simplest thing that just sets them going and it just i've never enjoyed watching two people i love fight over a tree before so i'm gonna give that one an up as well on the planet however i mean a Ah, Orion. In nearly 60 years of Star Trek, we've never been to Orion. Now, we've seen Orion outposts, we've been with Orion people, we have heard about Orion, but we've never actually visited the planet. This is, you know, this is a core piece of Star Trek. And I'm very, very excited about this. So, you know, you have them flying in on the shuttle and Tendi, again, she can tell she's clearly uncomfortable. And Mariner is just like, you live in a castle? Like, I'm from a post-scarcity world and this is impressive. Love that line, by the way. Taken up. Tendi's like, huh, you're barely even the fifth largest family in the Orion Syndicate. Um, and she's just downplaying it all so hard. Uh, to the point where it just makes me smile so much. You get, like, everyone has their beef with their family, right? Or, like, there's something in their past they're not super comfortable discussing. I will not be passing judgment over how Tendi was raised and the life she led before she joined Starfleet. Because, listen, we've all done things in our past that, out of context, perhaps, perhaps, may come across a little bit strange these days. Thankfully, I... <laughs> me no don't be silly they are greeted by seemingly an attack nope it's the bodyguards and they are put on a litter and they are carried and brought towards tendy's parents who are you know god the whole remember the whole mistress of the winter constellations thing yeah we start to see how other orions see tendy in this episode think of the most seemingly meek person you know and then imagine them as a warlord and that's kind of how they're portraying it in this one so you're like so you're like hey i'm tendy everything is great you don't need to cower in fear i mean i don't know how i'd react oh i should mention tendy's sister's been kidnapped the reason i kind of forgot is because of course she has it's an orion wedding like what were we expecting you have tendy basically tendy's like you know oh my god she's been kidnapped what a shock uh, but her parents do say, well, well, yeah, but, you know, kidnaps happen before the invitations go out. This is after. This is different. So Tendi's like, mm, okay, all right, all right. Well, we might take it seriously then. And so down they go to the nightclub together and we get the first stabbing of Mariner. You might be like, Sean, what the hell, man? Why are you... Why are you giving an up to Mariner getting stabbed? Well, the answer to that is, you'll see. You had people kowtowing to Tendi as they're walking into the club. You had, you know, this old high school friend of Tendi's who's just like, you know, oh, well, let's see if we can have a scorpion hand stingy shot thing off. I checked, that's the official name. Scorpion hand stinging shot thingy off. There we are. Just wait for that to be put on Memory Alpha. If it wasn't so lethal, it actually looks like quite a fun game. You know, you put your hand down on the pad and then, you know, you face your opponent. There's a lethal alien in the... I say alien, but animal, you know. Why is anything we don't know described as a thing? Put in the middle and then you have to take a shot. If you take a shot, a force field comes over your hand. You're fine. You're safe. It runs back toward the other one. And Tendi wins the game. Um, this whole time, Talyn is sitting there just taking notes on her pad because she's <laughs> she's kind of there, not so much as a, whoa, girls trip, but more, I'm compiling a report for Vulcan High Command on Orion specifics. <sighs> Take it up. And just like, Tendi's is like, y y maybe we can leave some of the stuff out of the report? And Talyn is like, hmm. Now, you may be wondering what's happened. Like, are we... Are we, are we just going to forget about Boimler and Rutherford who are at each other's throats? And, you know, they've, they've, they've decided that they will go to the holodeck together and maybe that they'll be able to, to patch things up. Uh, what's that? Just give me one second. You see, Bormler and Rutherford have decided that they will visit 
the old 19th century program featuring Mark Twain or Samuel Clemens, as he may also be known, and they need to reconcile their differences so that they may be able to continue living together. Well, their main problem was that they both arrived dressed as me, Mark Twain. I wrote Huckleberry Finn. I believe I should have some recognition. Well, in the spirit of being a 19th century gentleman, they are able to very quickly overcome their differences and they are able then to agree that Rutherford will be looking after the bonsai tree on even days and Boimler will be looking after the bonsai tree on odd days. There is a gentleman's agreement and everyone is delighted and happy. And as Boimler says, to paraphrase the old railroad breaker, a house divided in twain against itself cannot stand. The whole scene is an up, but also, I believe, a latinum up for the episode. Back on Orion, we have a discussion of Tendi saying, you know, oh, I knew her from high school. These friendships, they age badly. And then Talyn just goes, the idea of Orion's visiting secondary education is interesting to us. And Tendi's like, well, yeah, I mean, like, I think we got into the academy. It's like really simple and such a good question. And again, it kind of reminds you gently just how many preconceptions we all have still about Orion's. Remember, judge not lest ye be judged. I love the fact that Talyn earlier describes everything as it is in fact cool as hell. And then when they get down to the hump dungeon, which by the way, take a frickin' up, and we see Niall, who is De Erica's ex. There's a lot of names in this episode. De Erica is Tendi's sister. Tendi is of course Devana. Niall is the ex who was going to marry De Erica, but then she broke up with him and he ended up in the hump dungeon. Well, they see him and he's, you know, getting his pheromone on because as we know, a whole whack load of Orion females put their pheromones out and they put people in their thrall. Or as it's described in this episode, giving yourself over to the moans or enjoying the stank. A very confused up there. Yeah. So then uh, they see Niall and they start to kind of chase him. And then, you know, the the madam of the house who, I mean, we're all agreed that she's somewhat based on like Ursula from The Little Mermaid and Divine the Dry Queen, right? Okay. Yeah, we're all agreed. Cool. She flings another knife and hits Mariner in exactly the same spot on her shoulder. Take another up, poor Mariner's shoulder. Uh, and she says, what, what are the odds? Tendi is able to use her Starfleet science knowledge. These Orions are converging on Tindy, but she's just like, oh, okay. And she uses a hyperstray and frees these Orion males from the thrall. And they're like, oh man, am I in another hump dungeon? Oh, for God. And then they just walk out. And of course, then things change. It's like, oh, please, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, and they manage to question Niall. And oh, I've got a down for him. Except the fact that Talyn thinks he's aesthetically pleasing. That is an up. No, the down is that, you know, when we're in uh, Tendi's family home and Tendi hears, Niall might be involved. Oh my good. Oh, this is proper dangerous. Oh, oh, this is, this is bad. This is bad. And they meet Niall and she basically greets him with, Hey bestie, we're buds. Yeah, okay, you don't know where she is? No problem. Oh, ship graveyard. Cool, thanks, bye. Yeah, super dangerous. Down. Back aboard the Cerritos, uh, the Cerritos has actually turned up at a nebula that they're trying to scan, but actually they're faced with a Chalnok, who were, you know, they were first introduced in TNG Allegiance, as I'm sure you remember. Uh, you know, the Chalnok basically think Klingons on roids. There you go. And they're fighting over, like, your, your Federation scans will mess up this nebula. They are so thorough. Ah. And Freeman's like, it's my job. Um, I've got to do this. And, you know, Chalok's having none of it. You know, this is just as Boimler and Rutherford arrive on the bridge. And Freeman's like, oh, how can we ever find some common ground? Boimler and Rutherford look at each other. They have a suggestion. You did not think that you had seen the last of me, did you? Well, we return to Missouri and Freeman 
and the Chernock sit there and they discuss things in a southern fashion. Well, there is a little bit of interpretation as to what a southern fashion would be, as the Chernock is from southern Chernock and therefore does speak in their own southern tongue. Personally, I was laughing slightly too hard at this entire scene to really tell the difference. All I can say is another whopper of an up for this. Unfortunately, the charms of Missouri don't work. Funnily enough, a little bonsai tree helps. And they bring Chalnock to their quarters. And he looks at the tree and they're like, this is basically our child. And he scoffs it down in one. And then he feels the need to follow with some mist and drinks it down as well. While horrified parents, Rutherford and Boimler look on. Maybe I'm evil, but that's an up from me. We get to the ship graveyard and it seems like this season is just becoming a long love letter to Star Trek Voyager when we get a Raven class ship. Oh, I, I do like these. They, they're, you know, they're based on the Danube runabout, but then they're modified. Obviously, you know, this is a big piece of Seven of Nines history and just walking around the interior, which is fairly lovingly recreated from Dark Frontier. That was like a special kind of like, oh, I liked that feeling behind it. And of course, kind of shocking no one at this point. Yes, it's revealed that Erica effectively kidnapped herself because of, long story short, she was very frustrated with Tendi for, you know, Tendi was daughter prime and, you know, she was going to be, you know, the mistress of the Winter Constellations. She left and went to Starfleet, which put the pressure on to Erica. Now, De Erica wants to be the prime daughter, but she felt that she could never live up to Tendi. And she's been carrying a lot around a lot of this rage. So she organizes kidnapping, so Tendi would definitely have to come back and, and such and such. I'm sorry. She pulls a knife and uh, as soon as she does, Mariner just says, oh, no, I'm just, no, 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 no. Just hold on for one second. I'm just gonna nip over here. And then she hides down behind the console. De Erica throws it, Tendi ducks it, ricochets and hits Mariner on the shoulder again. It is a hat trick. What a wonderful up. I'm sorry, it is the joke that worked for me. The repeated joke, flipping worked for me. Big badass fight ensues and De Erica physically gets the upper hand. But Tendi is able to say, look, look at what you've managed to do. You beat me. There was never really any question as to whether they would hug it out. That, that's not the thing. The question is kind of how we would get there. And in Orion culture, a nice big beat em up kind of works, you know? And I enjoyed it. And so Tendi, using her Starfleet skills, hot wires this Raven class vessel to fly them back in time for the wedding. I have, I have a down because, right, uh, not for the Raven class at ship, but that there, there, there is a big massive backdrop behind this in this scene. And we know Raven type ships are at best, they're a scout ship. So why is there one that looks to be about the size of a galaxy class starship behind them? Did anyone else catch that? I was really like, okay. They get to the wedding, uh, everything, it's, it's all, you know, kind of like gender norm reversed. So whereas uh, uh, maybe a lot of us would be used to, you know, having the bride walk down the aisle and everyone goes, oh, she looks so radiant. Uh, they just flip it on its head. I don't know why, but it just works and it's so funny. You know, he's being walked down the aisle and Mariner's like, he's so radiant. And it's just, it's simple, but it's funny. It works. Back aboard the Cerritos, they go over everything. They go through the slideshow and Mariner goes, oh, that's where I was stabbed in the shoulder during the daddy-daughter knife dance. And Talin comments on the fact that there is a priest with an eight pack. Uh, and speaking of Talin, take another up Talin. She's so Vulcan and yes, you know, Tendi's like, so can we just like maybe not include everything you've learned today as part of the report back to the Vulcans? And Talin goes, whoops, seems like the data's corrupted. And Tendi's like, hmm? And we're all going like, well, the Vulcans can't lie. But then Talin just goes, using a, you know, using a subject's information without their consent would not be ethical. She's right. It wouldn't be. Take it up. 
The final disagreement between Rutherford and Boimler is that now they can't decide whether they should get a watercolour painting of the Enterprise D for their quarters or an oil painting of the Enterprise D for their quarters. So instead they settle on a very reasonable joint trip to the holodeck where they both play Mozart and they both agree that it shall be an acrylic Enterprise D. And they both start to play a harpsichord, which is... First of all, take a note because I love harpsichords. Second of all, here's a boring music lesson. Harpsichord, tickle the ivories, sure. So if you're familiar with pianos, you kind of know how a harpsichord works. Harpsichord, the big difference being much shorter keyboard, often two keyboards, and instead of where a piano, you press the key and a hammer goes forward and hits the string, a harpsichord, it goes the other way around and it comes up and it plucks the string, which is why you get that different sound. There you are. I just really like harpsichords. Take a note. Now folks, Take a trip with me, if you will, to Cetacean Observations. We have the Orion Interceptor. We have reference to a rusty chain tattoo, emerald chain, how are you getting on? In that first scene, you've got Dilithium, you've got a Vulcan Lerpa, you've got phasers of the 24th century variety, you've got a Starfleet pad, you've got a Batleth, you've got a Vulcan Lyre, you've also got an original series phaser, which is a bit badass. Of course, the Vulcan phaser rifle, which clearly dropped in a bin and will be rectified. Mm -hmm. And they talk about, you know, their friend who had metal attached to her head. We've seen that in several occasions before. Borderland and Bound would be two episodes of Enterprise to rewatch specifically after this episode. The first officer of this uh, Orion ship. I'm getting real Naomi from the Expanse vibes here, yeah? They talk about having to get into the belly dancer outfits for the Orion wedding, which is just hilarious. Boimler's new bedspread is from Andorian linen. Sorry, a cool duvet keeps the raisin rats away. Up. His mirror archer figure is on show, so is uh, Bo uh, Rutherford's DS9 model, and his techie what's it? That's what I'm calling it. We're on Orion! The whole sequence. The whole sequence on the steamship. The Missouri Times, Twain, everything about it is just, just watch Times Arrow again if you haven't in a while. A house divided. Uh, it was, I think it's originally from the Bible, but anyway, yeah, they're referencing Abraham Lincoln, who is, of course, that guest character from the original series episode, The Savage Curtain. The whole joke of like Starfleet made up pheromones because it's the only way to explain how a captain could be taken down so easily by Orions. Yeah, let's rewatch Enterprise Bound. As I mentioned earlier, the madam of the house very much getting Ursula, divine vibes off her. We have a hyperspray being used to save the day. Uh, the Chalnock, uh, of course, reference back to Next Generation episode Allegiance, uh, which I have not watched in a long time. But yeah, I will be going back to that one. Uh, Alien Twain, I'm sorry. South Chalnock, oh, just lovely. Uh, Raven class ship, of course, the bridge is perfect. <laughs> Tendy turning around to Talyn and being like, oh, I'm sorry, this is such a shock. And Talyn is like, your upbringing was quite obvious. Up. In that ship graveyard, okay, I'm going to accept all chiding for this one. I do see plenty of rings, so I'm going to say the ringed, like, Orion Interceptors from the original series, although you never get a clear shot of them. And there's lots of bits of other ships, which I will admit defeat to. I I, I was trying to see what they were part of, and I, and I couldn't get it. So look... If you see it and you go, oh, that's clearly a mm, please let me know in the comments. Put me out of my misery. Uh, let's not, of course, forget the, the reference to that lovely painting of the Enterprise D from Captain Picard's ready room. Now, we had a heck of a guest cast. We had Kamiko Glenn, who you might know if you've seen Orange is the New Black. We had Vanessa Marshall for any Star Wars Rebels fans out there. Uh, we had Lauren Tom for any Futurama fans out there. Carrie Walgren for any pa fans with, you know, ears. Like, seriously, what hasn't she done a voice in? Uh, Deborah Wilson, who actually we would know best as the voice of Lisa Cusack from the DS9 episode, The Sound of Her Voice. She also played Captain Trush in Prodigy's Supernova Part 1. Yes, Part 1. Uh, she also appeared in The Rise of Skywalker. A lot of Star Wars fans in this one. And, of course, Ariel Winter for fans of Modern Family as well. I've got a whole day to sit on this, and I've only just discovered that Time Zero Part 2 debuted today. Well, I mean, like 30 odd years ago. Huh. That is everything for our list today, folks. Let us know what you thought of this. Let us know what you thought of the episode. And are you excited? I mean, we're four episodes into Lower Decks now, which means there's only a few to go, but 
listen, we still have a few to go. That's, that's the good thing. You're awesome, you're wonderful. We are putting a big, massive push. We have 15,000 subscribers to go to get to 300,000 subscribers. So what I need from you, share these videos. Please subscribe, please hit like, please let people know. Share it on your socials, be it Twitter, be it Instagram, be it TikTok, be it Blue Sky, whichever one you do, please. I mean, look at what we've managed to do in the last year alone. Thank you so much for all of your support. Check out our episode of the podcast, which is coming up this week. We have a special guest. I don't want to give too much away, but um, we have engaged the Borg. I shall say no more. And that comes out every Tuesday, so please make sure that you're following along with that because we have a lot of fun putting that together for you. Retro ups and downs. You have been asking, we have been listening. What we've been trying to do is come up with the best way of doing it. So what we're gonna do is we're probably gonna take one or two of the big episodes, right? We're gonna do a poll, so don't worry, make sure that you get your say in. Uh, you can do hashtag retro ups and downs for suggestions. Uh, and don't forget hashtag ask Trek culture as well. We will announce the first round of choices in the coming weeks. I don't want to put a date in it because we're still, we're very much making this up as we go along uh, for, for, you know, for the poll to go ahead. We will then do that and then we will announce what the next one will be, what the next one in terms of polls as well. So we want you to let us know what you want to see because that's the most fun thing for everyone. So just to let you know, yes, we have been listening. We are looking at it. It'll be after Lower Decks anyway. So we'll be finishing this season of Ups and Downs. But yeah, something to look forward to. Folks, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Remember that you can follow us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. We're on Blue Sky at Trek Culture as well. We're on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. I'm at Sean Ferrick on both Twitter and Blue Sky. And Chris is at Edit Chris Edit on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram. You are awesome. You are lovely. You are wonderful. Our friends in Ukraine, Slav Ukraine. To everyone out there, be kind. Look after each other. Lead with kindness. If you see someone who needs a bit of a leg up, just say something nice. That's all. Thanks, everyone. I shall see you very, very soon. You're awesome. Have a great weekend. Make it so.